What's going on, everybody, and welcome to episode 59 of the Game Room Podcast. I'm your host, Rome, alongside Dev. Hey, what's up? How's it going, Dev? Pretty good. Phillies, man. Baseball starts uh, this week. I'm very excited. Yeah, I can tell. Very, very excited. I got some cheap tickets on the resale market on Geek, uh, what is it, SeatGeek? SeatGeek? Very excited. Um, But before we get into baseball, we got to talk about video games. We got some... Really uh, interesting stuff to talk about. We have uh, GTA 6 being delayed, possibly. Uh, Xbox is prototyping a new handheld device. Uh, and we're going to geek out a little bit about Marvel 1943, the rise of Hydra. Uh, so let's jump right in to number one on the headlines. We're going to be talking about Grand Theft Auto 6 possibly being delayed. Uh, this comes from Kotaku. GTA 6 production reportedly falling behind as Rockstar urges staff to return to office to avoid delay. Grand Theft Auto 6 is likely one of the most anticipated games in history, with millions of players around the world waiting for any scrap of info or screenshot of the upcoming open-world crime simulator. However, as remote workers struggle with an unwanted return to office mandate from Rockstar Games, struggle with an unwanted return... Oh, sorry. Kotaku has learned from sources with knowledge of the game's development process that GTA 6 could miss its 2025 release window and ship in 2026. What's up, Ty? Thank you. Will you uh, let us know what you think tomorrow. Um, so, officially unveiled in December 2023 after a massive leak in 2022, GTA 6 is the hotly anticipated follow-up from 2013's GTA 5. Um... Kotaku was told by sources with knowledge that the situation that early 2025 is currently the goal. However, Kotaku has learned that it's becoming more and more likely that the sequel might not land until late 2025. Even possible, it could slip to 2026. Um, In February, following numerous leaks, Bloomberg reported that Rockstar Games was mandating its employees to return to work five days a week in the office beginning in April. The short notice and drastic change caught many by surprise, and has led to frustration from staff who feel like they are being pushed out after they after being hired remotely. 
While security and quality are reportedly the main reasons Rockstar is instituting the mandate to return to office, Kotaku was told by sources who wish to remain anonymous to avoid possible retaliation that development on GTA 6 has started falling behind. Uh, Kotaku was told that this leadership at Rock that leadership at Rockstar is nervous and worried about the game missing the 2025 window and slipping into 2026, and is another big reason the company is pushing for return to office in April. Uh, at the moment, Kotaku was told that Rockstar is still aiming for the game to arrive in spring of 2025. While an early 2025 release is the goal, sources say they aren't sure if this will happen, and a fall 2025 launch seems much more plausible and feasible. Meanwhile, delaying the game to 2026 is is on the table as a sort of fallback plan or emergency option if needed. And of course, it should be noted that, and Kotaku was reminded when talking to folks about the situation, that Rockstar historically waits until the last minute to make changes or alter plans. So the next trailer for the game, no word on when to expect that, might not reflect a delay as the company pushes forward on development. Kotaku did end up reaching out to Rockstar. Uh, speaking to Aftermath, one employee shared concerns at, that after improving over the last few years, Rockstar could slide back into developer crunch as GTA 6 enters the final part of its long development. Uh, we're concerned about going back to that, said one Rockstar employee. Uh, I've been through a couple of projects, both of which had crunch. The first one was extremely difficult. I had way less gray hair back then. We want to continue the strides we've made as a company to remove the toxic culture. Um... So, Dev, uh, I'm just going to start, in your opinion, what do you think the likelihood uh, of seeing GTA 6 in spring 2025? It doesn't seem that high. Um, you think fall seems more pleasable? plausible? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if even 2025, you know, it, it sounds like it's going to be a very large game. It's going to need a lot of time, a lot more time. Um, I mean, giving themselves, what, they're giving themselves basically a year. Yeah, more or less. That, that does feel too soon. Uh, I think fall is way more plausible. So for me, I, I don't know if I 100% believe this report, to be honest. So I, I, I'm i reading this report, and I like I obviously it's definitely plausible. Mm-hmm. But so for starters, I, I think that the, the return to the office thing definitely could coincide with that. And I think that that's the one credible thing about the game that makes me feel this way. Okay. I, I wonder, like, so Kotaku, right? They're the source on this. And there was actually some news with Kotaku earlier this week, and I wonder if this was kind of something where they were trying to help their case. But so basically Kotaku is getting rid of, like, their news part, and they're turning into, like, a guides website. Okay. And, like, the I think the editor-in-chief stepped down, and, like, this, that, and the, th- and the third, and... And the, apparently, they uh, the company that owns Kotaku is expecting them to produce like fifty guides a week, and people are like, "That's not yeah, feasible." So like, and then like literally the next day, Kotaku. Who, to be fair, I don't think Kotaku in like recent years has really gotten a lot of like s- like scoops. But I don't know. Part of me wonders if like someone was like, "Can you give us anything?" Like, we need some we need some news clicks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe I'm just being like paranoid, but I don't know. Um, <sighs> it's one of those things where even if it, it's it's like a flip of a coin at this point. Um, games are large. This game has a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's gonna. I think they're gonna make sure it's right when it comes out, or as right as it can be. I agree. I think that. It, I I just think they're gonna stick to that spring twenty twenty five release date. I wouldn't be surprised if I was wrong, um, but my gut's just telling me that I think that they're gonna they're gonna nail it, especially if they do get their way and they get the return to office that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I mean. Could be a similar situation to, you know, the year, you know, we were expecting Starfield and then it got delayed by a year. So, you yeah, never know. That's true. Uh, but so, yeah, that's, that's what's going on with Grand Theft Auto 6. Uh, again, like, it was big news, but I really just didn't feel like there was much to it. You know what I mean? Like, even, like, the, even the report doesn't really give a reason. It's just, yeah, they're, we're behind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I've been working on this game for, like, 15 years. Yeah. So, it's like, I don't know. Or, like, what is it? 12 years yeah 12 years like I, I i don't know i just can't see how you're a year behind at this point but i don't know i mean it's you know what I mean? like i mean it's the series finale of video games you so gotta give it all so yeah yeah for sure like this is the last video game that's ever coming out as far as i'm concerned i don't believe for one second that another game is ever coming out after grand theft auto 6 we'll see like that's it like we're wrapping it up 
We're going to have a great time with it. Nintendo's not going to get the memo. <laughs> it's a post-apocalyptic world. It's just Nintendo putting out games. <laughs> um, here's a, We'll stick with the GTA news, because there was another thing that, again, pure speculation, but tech experts uh, of Digital Foundry, uh, the, specifically its founder, Rich Ledbetter, uh, has said that people shouldn't expect GTA 6 to run at 60 frames per second on the PS5 Pro. Ledbetter's comments come following Insider Gaming's exclusive reports on the PlayStation 5 Pro specs, which revealed the CPU uh, of the Pro will be identical to the standard system with a 10% increase in gigahertz. Speaking on special edition of the Digital Foundry Direct, Ledbetter said all of the sort of conjectures that that they that this is going to be a great box for Grand Theft Auto 6 will be able to run that 60 frames per second unless there's some magical CPU stuff being done by Rockstar. Uh, I suggest that's not going to happen. An extra 10% on clocks isn't really going to do much at all. The Pro has a high CPU frequency mode, which takes the CPU from uh, to 3.85 gigahertz, a 10% increase over the standard console, which is unlikely to have a major effect on FPS performances. But as co-host Alexander uh, Batagilla points out, that necessarily won't be the case for all games. Uh, so by Ledbetter's comments, at least, we shouldn't really expect GTA 6 to run uh, at a higher frame rate on the PS5 Pro as compared to the other console offerings, both from Sony and Microsoft. Yeah. Well, you know, makes sense, generally. I mean, di- I'm Digital Foundry, they know their stuff. I mean, they're kind of like the experts o- on that field of gaming, that part of gaming, mm-hmm. at least in my mind. So, I mean, if, if, the, if the head of Digital Foundry says, hey, looking at this, like, I can't see this doing anything for it, I mean, I'm going to be inclined to believe them, um, which if that's the case, I mean, I, I think this continues to kind of feed into the the PS5 Pro and like, you know, who is it for these mid-gen upgrades? And and I think that that kind of circles back to uh, my, my thought process with this generation of games. And again, this is not a PlayStation thing. This is Xbox and PlayStation where it's like, I just don't like ha- has Sony and Microsoft really pushed the this generation to its limits? Like, I, I just, I just, I, if, if that, if so, I'm not particularly impressed, to be honest. I think we're going to be surprised at how much, how many units they sell, both, on both sides, if they release a mid-gen. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's not the case. I just think that, like, is it warranted, is my point. Is it warranted? Like, Probably it, not. Not this generation doesn't feel like it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's just weird. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And whether or not they can get it running at 60 frames, I think that's more on Rockstar side. So, we'll see. I mean, yes and no. I think at the end of the day, like, it, it's all about if, you know, if they're developing for these for these consoles, and they, obviously, they're going to have a dev kit for the PS5 Pro. Yeah. I mean... That's what I'm saying. It's on But, that, if, but it's if the on GPU there. can't do it, like, if it can't do it, it can't do it. I mean, if it's not enough of, the, enough of a leap to make that jump... I like, don't see why not, though. Like, if there are already other games running at 60 frames per second on a native PS5. Yeah, but you can make why the same. Why is a stronger PS5 Pro? Why wouldn't it do that for that game? You know what I mean. That's what I'm saying. It's up to Rockstar to. The yeah. hardware is there. It can go 60 frames. We see other games do it. I hear you. I just think console. GTA 6 is just a behemoth. This game is going to be. Yeah, I mean, there's already behemoth games. That's, I suppose it's, it's the developer thing. You have to optimize for the consoles. That's all. Well, then, so we'll get delayed till 2026. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Then. Um, all right. I mean, we'll we'll keep tabs on GTA Six as as time goes on. I'm sure we'll hear some more news at some point this year. Um, so stay tuned for that. Let's move on to number two in the headlines. Uh, Xbox is prototyping a native Xbox handheld. It, it you know it's being claimed. I'm excited to talk to you about this because you're kind of like a handheld guy. Um, Jez Corden of the Xbox Two podcast has claimed that Xbox is working on a new native Xbox handheld. On his podcast, the Xbox 2 podcast, a great listen, by the way, um, Corden said, I know that they've got handheld prototypes right now. Corden soon clarified that these are new prototypes and not the old prototypes often referred to. As pointed out in the podcast, prototypes don't necessarily mean that new products are coming to market, but Xbox is pursuing a handheld, or Xbox pursuing a handheld isn't all that surprising. Corden later said, no, this is not a cloud handheld. It's fully native Xbox handheld. Um, so, Dev, for me, I think that going for a fully native Xbox handheld is 
is really key here, at least in terms of my interest in the in in the device. Um, I think not just doing like a cloud item or a cloud handheld. Um, what are your thoughts on Xbox doing a native handheld? Uh, it's cool, I guess. It just it feels late. It already feels late to the party. I think everyone else, because you can run Xbox on Windows, mm. anything that's a Windows handheld can play these games. Making it native is cool, I guess. Having its own like it's its own. Console. Yeah, you boot it up, it's going to be an Xbox in your have hands. To make it significantly cheaper than what's already out there. If you try to get anywhere close to like anything more than two hundred dollars, I would just get. You don't think that this coming from the first party hardware would probably make it like a better place to run at least these Xbox games? I mean, it's usually kind of the argument where, you know, first party developers, they work with that hardware like first and foremost. So you don't think that that might not be the... So my question is, do you think that that theoretically, wouldn't that make this Xbox handheld the best place to play in terms of handheld? Not necessarily, no. Because there's already... When they make these games, they do... They already they make them for PC. You mm-hmm. know what I mean. They sure. already run well on PC. The handhelds are just handheld PCs. Mm-hmm. It's just a laptop and a hand. You know what I mean. They're massive. They're kind. Of, that's why they're so big. But like, that's already there. And because they're a PC handheld, you can play Steam games on it too. So I, if I'm going to spend four or five hundred dollars on something, I want to play everything I can play on Xbox already. Mm-hmm. At least the PC sense and something I can play Steam games with. It's just okay. it feels late to the party. They're going to have to really do something different. They're going to have to stand out. So I I don't agree with it being late to the party necessarily. Um, I, I do understand that obviously things like the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally are out there. Yeah. Um, and there's just new ones every year. There's the, the one that just came out recently, which is better than, it's supposed to be better than the ROG Ally. So, and there's another competitor that just came out, I think two weeks ago, that's already competing against the Steam Deck. It's just like... So how powerful are these handhelds, let me ask you? Because... Uh, like, I don't remember where I saw it, but I definitely saw a rumor saying, speculating that this would. Do you think that it would be beneficial for the product if it launched and, like, let's say it was parable with a in term power wise with like a Series S, which is like obviously not a powerhouse like the Series X is, mm-hmm. but you know, I mean, I I think that that would be a pretty well powered machine for a handheld. Yeah. I think so. If, it, if it's running on the same level as a, as a Series S, and that could make a lot of sense because that's already what developers are kind of used, you know, used to. They're, would, I, I can't would, see them having a SKU that's weaker, or I'm not weaker, but less powerful than a Series S. It would have to be that minimum mm-hmm. because just because, like you said, like they're already developing for the Series S. Um, but also there are, are handhelds that are the Steam Deck itself. The most powerful one is as about as powerful as as a Series S. So it's like. They're going to have to do some things that make it stand out. Maybe sell it kind of like a Switch kind of thing. Like They're going to have to do something different. I'm sure that they'll have some sort of dock to it. I mean, well, keep in mind, we talked about about, what was it, a month ago at this point, where the next generation of Xbox is rumored to be two SKUs again, one of them being a dockable, handheld, yeah. so Switch-like device. This could be, what if this is kind of like them getting their name in that market, and then a couple of years down the line, it's like, hey, here's the next gen this is the one. Like, like, do you think that that is a smart strategy for them if that's what they're doing here? I think you... I think... Because I think they're so late in this race, I think you have to go all out on your first one. You have I, to... I mean... Give people a reason to get into your product. I mean, yes and no. I think it makes sense for them. I mean, keep in mind, this is a, a market that PlayStation currently isn't in, and, uh, you know, we're... They're, they're getting ready to get into this. I think that handheld is making a big return for a lot of people. Me personally, like, that's just not how I consume my games. But, I mean, like, when this news came out, I was trying to decide, like, is this something that would interest me? And I, depending on price, I think price is really where it kind of comes in. Because price if, is a big thing for it. If you tell me that this handheld is the Xbox ecosystem running natively, no cloud streaming on it, because, again, I just don't think the technology is there. That's just my opinion. Um, like, I just don't have interest in consuming games in that way also. But if you're telling me that this machine, ha- you know, it's portable, it's kind of like a Switch, basically a Switch, and I'm like, it has all my Xbox games, Game Pass, and it's native to Xbox. Like, depending on the price point, that's something I could definitely see myself picking up and you know taking with me when we go places. I mean, yeah, if it's cheap enough, yeah. Yeah, like I, 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 price point is going to be key on that. Though. That's what I'm saying too. If 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 it's cost a lot of money, I might as well get something that does everything that that does plus more. Like, I, I mean, how much is the Rog Ally? Like four hundred, right? Yeah, they're about four hundred. 
Um, for the for like the lower models, like the okay. higher models are about six hundred. So in that range, if it's anywhere near that range, I'm what if it's like three hundred? Still, I'd rather spend an extra hundred dollars to for something that's pow- more powerful and does more. You know I'm trying I mean? to be funny here, but how about two hundred? Oh yeah, definitely get it. But it's just it's just. It, I think two hundred would be where they would go. That's just my a, prediction. They're getting into a market that's already established, mm-hmm. so they're they're gonna have to like if you're gonna take over, they're gonna have to lose some money on units or something they're gonna have to really stand out with this unit so i also think that it's not like the switch where the switch gets exclusive content this is this is an addition to your ecosystem so my other question this is a question that ty raised in the discord that i thought was a really good question what do you think would be more beneficial for them to do for this handheld if it were open source where it's like steam you know epic game store can run on it or do you think it would be better for xbox in xbox's interest to hey this is an xbox device you boot it up it takes you to the xbox you know dashboard you access the xbox store you play your xbox games and that's it what which one do you think would be more beneficial for them because you're you're saying that as someone who's interested in this line of of gaming consoles let's say if this thing can't compete with like the rog ally and stuff like that is there a point for them doing that or should they try to focus in on the xbox crowd or the console crowd who don't you know, play on PC, so therefore they're not looking at the ROG ally. At that point, I don't think you call it an Xbox device, though. It's that, Then it becomes a Windows device. If it's open source. Yeah. Okay. Which, I, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's, I disagree it's, with that. I think the, I think brand matters. We talk a lot about brand here, yeah, and I think brand yeah. matters. It, I would go with Xbox regardless. It would almost feel corny as if you're getting, like, an Xbox-branded laptop. You know what I mean? In that sense. Yeah, but, like, at the end of the day, Xbox is Microsoft's gaming division. So, like, actually, I would push back and say... If it's specifically a gaming laptop, I would not, I would not like bat an eye at it. If it was an Xbox laptop, yeah, I wouldn't. Like it's that. their gaming. It's 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 their gaming wing. It's their yeah, brand of gaming. No, I get that. Like, it's like if Coke put out like another version of Coke, saying, and like this like, is our new Sprite. Like, no, like, this is Coke. It's not even like an Xbox gaming laptop. It's just an Xbox laptop. But I'm saying like in terms That's of gaming, kinda... like if it's your gaming brand, if they put out a handheld that's specifically for gaming. Like, it should be called an Xbox. Yeah. Whether it's open source or not. That's just how I feel. I think brand's important. Like, you would, like, don't... Use your brand to your advantage. You, you like... The, so, the Xbox drops on the marketplace. Again, like, you gotta keep in mind. Like, we're talking about this. Like, we, we know stuff. We, like, we know how the industry works. We know these things. Like, you know what a rag, ROG ally is. You know, a lot of people, if you say, like, hey, you know what the ROG ally is? They'll be like, what? I don't know what that is. I think... But you know what they do know? They know the name PlayStation. They know the name Xbox. They know the name Nintendo, and like, and that's that's where the brand becomes relevant. And it's like, I don't care if this is native in terms of it's just an Xbox in your hands, or if it's an open source device. Like you call it an Xbox because people are going to recognize, like, oh, Xbox. I know what Xbox is. I don't think they're going to make it an open source device. Though. You don't think so? No, I think I I'm think dash- I'm kind of fifty fifty on it. To I be think honest. the dashboard is going to look very similar to the Xbox dashboard. I think when you bring something into your ecosystem, that's what you're looking for anyway. Yeah. You're looking for an extension of your your main product yeah. or your main products. I think when you turn that on, it opens up the Xbox Windows dashboard, and that's what you see. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so we're gonna have to you know keep an eye on this. I mean, obviously, there's other news kind of going into this. We talked about it last week, where um, the dev kit in South Korea was discovered. So that could be what this is. The handheld mm-hmm. um, could also be. Kind of coincide with uh, what Sarah Bond said at the Xbox PR event a couple months ago at this point where she said, like, hey, we have exciting hardware this holiday. So, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. I mean, obviously, the next opportunity from Xbox to kind of share what they got is in June. So, we have a little ways to go. But, I mean, we'll have to check out the Xbox showcase when that time comes. Number three. This is technically number four, because the GTA 6 one was two. Devro, I saw one of my most anticipated games uh, revealed this week uh, for 2025. Marvel 1943, Rise of Hydra was revealed. Um, I spent some time watching the trailer. I also watched the Unreal Showcase presentation of the game. Um, I think you did as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I want to ask you, what did you think about this trailer for Marvel 1943, Rise of Hydra? It looks... It looks good. It looks fun. This game, I, I just, I'm so excited for this. I mean, obviously I want to see a little bit more gameplay, which they make clear during the Unreal presentation that it's like, hey, this is all like in-game stuff that they're capturing. 
Um, but I do want to see what the gameplay is a little bit more. Obviously, they say it's a, an action adventure game, which is definitely something that's up my alley. Uh, Captain America is my favorite hero, so that's also really up my alley. And it's World War II, which is also something that I really like. Yeah. So I mean, like from a from a pitch perspective, they from like you. they got me. Like I'm so into this. Like uh, I think the cutscene that they show between uh, Cap and and this era's Black Panther just looks so cool. Uh, I love the the idea here where it's they're they're not gonna like the I, look. I'm sure by the end of the game they're gonna be working together. But like you know, it's it's kind of like a there's Cap doing his thing and Black Panther doing his thing and the Nazis are doing their thing and uh, I'm I'm just really excited for this all around. I'm super stoked for it. Uh, definitely, I'm sold on the pitch. If this was Shark Tank, I'm I'm like I'm in. It's like I will fund this project. Um, but like I was also like I said, I was watching the Unreal Engine stuff and I was just really impressed by like what they're doing with the environments in this game and and all that stuff. And I just, I just think Unreal Five is just. I mean, it was impressive when they showed it off, like, two years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they showed us, like, ten seconds. Like, the... No, they showed a lot. They showed, like, a whole game no, demo for it. Remember? No, no, no. I don't think so. It was, like, a ten-second snip. No, they showed, like, remember the girl? She was, like, crawling through the mountains, and they were, they were like, making sure you knew, like, this is... Oh, like... I, thought you meant un... I thought you meant the game. Oh, not the game. Oh, okay. No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant Unreal in general. Okay, I thought you meant Marvel 1943, and I was oh, like... No, yeah, that, that was I was like, no, it was a ten-second clip. Yeah, that was a clip. <laughs> I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, no, yeah. I, I, I know, but this was just kind of, like... It's like one of those things where it's like, this isn't a tech demo. You know what I mean? Like, years of, of following games, it's like, you know to take tech demos with, like, a grain of salt. Yeah. Like, especially for Zelda fans. We take tech demos <laughs> absolutely with the, the, the biggest grain of salt. Um, but no, I was just, I was super blown away, super impressed with uh, with this trailer and with the game and how it's looking. And you got Amy Henning from uh, Uncharted and Naughty Dog working on the on the narrative here. I'm just all in on this. Like everything about this pitch just sounds great to me. The only thing I need now is, is um, is some gameplay. It's coming 2025. Yeah. Um, let's uh, read the synopsis real quick. Uh, in the chaos of war, worlds collide. Skydance New Media and Marvel Games share an original story where an ensemble of four heroes must overcome their differences and form an uneasy alliance to confront their common enemy. According to Skydance, the narrative-driven ensemble adventure... That sounds great. <laughs> narrative-driven action adventure game? Sign me up. Uh, we'll have players controlling an ensemble of four characters. A young Steve Rogers, Captain America. Uh, Azuri T'Challa's grandfather and, a, and the World War II-era Black Panther. Gabriel Jones, a U.S. soldier and member of the Howling Commandos. Uh, and Nanali, leader of the fledgling Wakandan spy network. The game is the first title from Skydance New Media, a studio formed in 2019 by Hollywood production company Skydance. I can't imagine a better partner than Marvel for our first game, said studio president uh, Henning, who previously spent a decade at Naughty Dog, where she was creative director and lead writer of the Uncharted series. The Marvel Universe epitomizes all the action, mystery, and thrills of the pulp adventure genre that I adore and lends itself perfectly to an interactive experience. It's an honor to be able to tell an original story with all the humanity, complexity, and humor that makes Marvel characters enduring and to enable our players to embody these heroes that they love. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just I'm very excited for this game. Can't wait to, to hear more. Um, hopefully we see some gameplay soon. Number five on the headlines. Uh... This is kind of dumb news, but, you know, the Dragon's Dogma launched uh, to mostly negative review bombing after microtransaction reveal, and, uh, yeah. So, this uh, comes from Windows Central, uh, and it was, as they wrote this article, Capcom's new ARPG Dragon's Dogma 2 is now officially playable on PC through Steam, with the game sl slated to go live on Xbox and PlayStation in just a few hours. It's now out everywhere. Um... It was supposed to be an exciting ce celebratory launch of, se of a sequel that fans have been waiting for for over a decade, though, has been marred by controversy. When the game became available, a previously hidden suite of microtransaction purchases did as well. Um, these include everything from rift crystals used to hire other players' pawns to art of metamorphosis tomes required for changing your character's appearance, along with wakestone revival items, port crystal, fast travel points, one-use keys to escape prison cells, incenses for editing a pawn's inclination... Um, which is usually randomized, 
uh, monster lures, and even special camping equipment that weighs less than, than normal gear um, are all visible on the DLC page for the game. Uh, the price of these transact microtransactions ranges from $1 to $5. Um, this all on top of the fact that Dragon's Dogma 2 is a $70 single-player RPG. Um, many players not happy. On Steam, it plummeted down to a mostly negative rating with only 34% of the reviews positive. Um, then, after purchasing uh, the Deluxe Edition, I went to install it today and saw a whole page dedicated to its microtransactions in the store, wrote player Superius. How do you even have the nerve to put any microtransactions transactions in an already fully priced single player game? It's so wild to me. Uh, and obviously the complaints go on and on from there. Um, now there was a lot of back and forth that followed after this in terms of, well, like you don't need to do it. Like you can play the game and not have to worry about these things. Yeah. And I, and I feel like I know where you're going to stand on this. And I think you probably know where I stand on this. Um, but for the sake of the fact we're doing a show, Forrest says games are just Disney rides. Buy the Fast Pass to ride to rude faster. I know what he meant, but I like to think that he meant to rude faster. Um, so, all right, Dev, let's get into it real quick. What What are your thoughts on on, on this situation with the microtransactions uh, in Dragon's Dogma Two? I think it's. I at first I hated it, but then I keep hearing a lot of people who are actually playing the game. Like, mm -hmm. They're not in your face. No one's forcing you to buy these microtransactions. They're not advertising it to you. And it doesn't really affect the gameplay. You can get everything you need in the game from the game. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fine. It's it's weird to do it, but like no one's really suffering from it. And that's why I think it's like I'm okay with it. So here's my thing with it, right? I think number one, even if it's not as bad in this game, I think that exploitation of customers in video games is a very slippery slope. And I think that if you set a precedent, what the other game publishers will follow suit and try to take it one step further. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. So I, number one, I, I, I understand that it may not be a big deal for this game specifically. Um, that being said, I think that charging for basic features that have always been available in games is gross and I'm not a fan of it, and I have made a purchasing decision not to buy Dragon's Dogma 2 because of it. Um, but it's like also one of those things where if you don't want to pay for extra stones to teleport, then don't do it. The problem with that is, and like I totally get that, but the the problem is is that they did it, period. Like It doesn't matter if like if me playing the game, I don't need to do it. But like, because they make it a thing, and then the next company is going to see, well, they did it, so we're going to do it, and maybe then next time that company decides, hey... We aren't going to make it like Dragon's Dogma 2 exactly where we're going to make you pay for fast travel or there is no fast traveling. And I think that in the game, like we've seen it with things, whether it be battle passes or like we can go through the entire history of the games industry. We'll be here all night. Like when these practices come up where the, where the develop, like, it, like raising prices of premium games, right? Like everyone was just waiting for that first person to blink. Who's going to bump their games to 70? And I'm not saying that I don't think the games at this point should be 70, but we were just waiting for the for the pen to drop. We were waiting for that first publisher to be like, we're making our game $70. And then what happened? As soon as that one, first one took that jump, almost all of the, the uh, publishers have followed suit. That and that's just like, an example. That but, sounds like we're blowing this so out of proportion, I think. I, for example, Assassin's Creed, in every single Assassin's Creed game, there's always microtransactions. Even in the newer ones. And it's not just it's not just cosmetic stuff. You can buy weapons with actual stats. People, nobody says, oh, that's pay to win. Like, you just don't buy, you just don't spend money on it. No one, no one. So again, for me, for then, me, it's about basic features, right? Like, I'm not saying I like those transactions either. But in terms of making it clear that I don't approve of it, I think there's a big difference between paying for fast travel points and paying for a new sword. Like I like I just to me those just aren't the same thing. It's like how would you feel? Like and I use this analogy in the Discord. And Ty laughed at it, but I mean I think it's a pretty decent analogy. So like let's say you go to a restaurant, right? And you sit down at the restaurant, you order your food, you pay for your food. And then you look at your bill and you were charged for using a plate with your food. Wouldn't that be kind of like wait a second. I I paid for this food and you didn't give it to me on a plate, so you charged me to use a plate? Like, you'd be pretty fucking annoyed with that, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, like, it's, for me, that's the same thing. It's like, again, I understand that these that games need to make money somehow. I understand that they, like, I'm not naive to the fact that games 
are expensive to make and they need to recoup these costs. I get that. I get the business side of it. But I am not going to sit here and, and say like, okay, well, this game offers microtrans- a microtransaction in a form of buying fast travel points. Which, by the way, I think another reason that people are upset about it is because the developers of this very game said that fast travel is lame and stupid and basically talked down on it. And then they, they were like, games shouldn't need fast travel. And then you turn around, you sell it to to people. And I just think that that's kind of scummy. I just don't like it. I don't vibe with it. And look, I'm more power to people. They can buy what they want. And choice is great. And I understand that choice is great. But it's a slippery slope. And I just don't want to see things get worse. I don't approve of this. It does it really matter in the vacuum that is Dragon's Dogma 2? Probably not. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it's a business practice that I do not I vibe any with. Any game, any game. Like, I know that in certain MMOs and stuff like that, you can buy, you know, stones that make you fast travel. Like, that's just a thing you can do. So, Forrest agrees with me. You know, when we were talking about the sword to fast travel, he said, that's not as bad as a basic mechanic. And I agree. Like, could you imagine if, but like... But it's not the only way you what can if they get start, the, It's what not if, the only way you can get those items, though. You can play the game and get them. But, again, if you want to pay to pay more, like, get more, I don't see why that's, just like... So, if people, another... People so, play to win games all the time. And I just don't. This is just another way to do that. Again, it's it's, it, I think it's not about. And it's not even a multiplayer game. You know what I mean? Right, but it's a basic quality of life feature that games have always had. And like again, look at it this way. And this is where my point is: is not like it's not strictly just about Dragon's Dogma Two, but what it represents, what the what the idea of doing it represents. If a game were to come out tomorrow, right, and f- fast traveling was completely locked behind a microtransaction. What was your initial reaction when when you read it the news? It sounds new- like a shitty game. Exactly, and that's what I'm saying. It's just but what if like we've Dogs seen- is not a shitty game? <laughs> but it's if it's a shitty game, it, you but know if what it happens? sets the precedent, no. But if it's a shitty game, you know what happens? It doesn't sell well. Yeah, and people say, "Why doesn't it sell well?" And it's because look what happened with Battle um, Battlefield Two. Mm. It came out horrible. Microtransactions. Battlefront Two, you mean? Yeah, Battlefront Two. The microtransactions were bad. It had like a whole loot, like a whole the loot boxes, loot, loot boxes, boxes and everything. People hated it. They stopped paying for the game. They, but they, they got their money back, and they had to change it. But so let me counter. They saw, they saw the lashback. Yeah, and, and now the Battlefront franchise is pretty much dead. I mean, the game is still good. Battlefront, uh, yeah, Battlefront Two is. Still yeah, good. but look, look at the pivot that was made because of how much of a failure it was. So instead, oh, absolutely. So instead, okay, well now EA, you know EA is just not making Star Wars games anymore. Do you know what that showed? Other companies are like, hey, we're not going to do that loot box or. Like you have to, but have it's that still got to that, to that point, down. though. It's still it always got to, gets to that point. But that's my point. It like it's a slippery point. slope, and that's why you should be against letting it get to that point. Let it get to that point. So we why let it get to that wrong. point? It's the same thing with NFTs. Let let them put all the NFTs in games. Exactly. So they but see that nobody wants that, and they get rid of it. But that's what I'm doing. I'm saying that, in my opinion, I'm going to take a stand here and say, like, hey, like, y- all right, take is a stand. it not it's that really bad? Not that bad. If if the people who were playing the game actively were like, yo, this is really bad, like. I don't have enough, and they're they're for obviously forcing you to to pay for it. Yes, that is bad. If there, if there's flashes on the screen of buy it now, see that's Forrest bad. Forrest gets it, he, and I agree. Like it's like taking away the pause menu. Like is that what's next? Like we're gonna have to pay to be able to so pause our this, game. No, it's so like oh, dramatic. what if what if it's you have so to pay to save dramatic. your game? Are you gonna so are, is hey you know it's not it's that big so of a dramatic. deal. Maybe it's a good game. I, like why would because you pay you the ten dollars to save your game? The game. Right, but I still have the principle of it. Look, again, I'm not sitting here saying... It's like when people complained about Starfield, and it's like... Look, I'm you, not you're saying... Like, I really enjoyed the game. That that wasn't an issue for me. All those loading screens wasn't an issue for me. What if it's not an issue for the, everyone who's playing the game? That's great. Again, uh, to reiterate, I'm not saying Dragon's Dogma 2 is a bad game. I'm like, I'm not the kind of person that would go on Steam and negatively review it. Like that, I, I think that's a little much, but like at the end of the day, like, no, I'm going to stand by what I feel is right and vote with my wallet and say, Hey, I don't appreciate these microtransactions being a part of your game. Your game may be great, but I don't agree with what's going on in the business side of, of the business you're doing. Therefore, I am not going to buy the game. Okay. Which again, like I, that's, that's the point. And I think that's the point that most people are taking most normal people, by the way, like going after developers will always be gross and never not will never be an acceptable thing to do. And, and things like that. But it's a slippery slope. And that's my concern. Where does the buck stop? It's a slippery slope. And you're saying, oh, let it. scenario that you're creating. Yeah, I agree. Forrest thinks I'm on to something there. Pay to save. That even sounds like something that they would come up with. Pay to save. 
Yeah, that sounds that sounds like something the games industry would come up with. Okay. You guys are picking up pitchforks and torches for for an not issue at all. that doesn't even involve you because playing the game is not. People were saying playing the game is not even an issue. See, I wouldn't say. I think you're being over. And you're like, well, this could lead to this and this and this. And it's just. I like, think you're over. I think you're being over dramatic. I'm being over dramatic. I'm okay. Yeah, I think you're being over dramatic. I'm being over dramatic. You're the one that's crying over something. You of a game that you're not even going to get. Again, not even crying. I'm just. You're you're, you're like. I think if you do this now in twenty years. We're paying to save. No, like two years. <laughs> Two years, not twenty. So years. dramatic. No, what I'm saying is, you know, I heard you four times. I get it. What I'm saying is that you, you, think I'm that not pitching. I'm not saying I'm picking up a pitchfork or anything. I'm just saying that these types of things should be kept in check. And so, as a consumer with purchasing power in the industry, because I spend thousands of dollars in the industry a year, why are and we many acting like people... this is even a new thing? Any any live service game has these. Has this already? Yeah, you know, that's why I think live service games are fucking trash. Well, that's We're, why you don't play live service games, yeah, right? They're trash. Yeah, that's not, not this trash. Isn't, this isn't new. You're like, but you know, you know what happens when you play those games? You just don't buy the stuff. It's that simple. That's a bad game, then. No, it's not. You can still get it. You just don't buy it. Anyways, it's literally that simple. Anyways, hey, if you're enjoying Dragon's Dogma two, more power to you. That's great. Uh, if you don't like shitty business just practices, in, you know, if you're enjoying you, video games, you should be enjoying video games and not. Throwing pitchforks in over things that just don't matter. I like how you keep acting like I'm overreacting. I'm just saying, hey, this isn't cool. I don't think they should do this. Okay. And it could get worse. Which All right. it, you don't think that's factually a true statement? It could. Yes. It could. The it yeah, could get it worse. Could get worse. Yeah. Everything in gaming. I like could how get dismissive worse. you are of that. It's just like. <laughs> yeah, because you're making it such a big deal, and it's like. Once I heard that the people playing the game mm-hmm. don't have an issue with it, then I don't have an issue with it. Right, I never... Period. Yeah, it's great. People are enjoying the game. Yes. That's what they should be doing. Why are you getting so upset? Are you okay? Y- no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just like... I'm just like, hey, I don't think this is a really cool thing for them to do. And you're like, oh, what are you talking about? Like, but it, it's not even <laughs> that it sets a bad <laughs> idea. This isn't new. It continues to set a bad precedent. This isn't new. It's a, it's a mechanic, though, says Forrest. He's right. Yeah, but it's not new. All right, well, it's still bad. Okay, it's, it's not new. Okay, it's still a bad business practice. And you know what you do? You don't pay for it. Well, that's why I'm not buying the game. Okay, don't buy the game. And if you do buy the game, you don't pay for it. You just play the game out like normal. Or you just not buy the game. But they already they got the game. See, he's playing it right now. Cool, good for them. I'm glad like, they enjoyed it. It reviewed really well. It like it's just, probably a great game. It looks like he's just playing the game. Yeah, it reviewed really well. Seems like it's a great game. I think it's like an 87 on Metacritic. It's like... It's like he's really upset. It's like getting a gotcha game and like... Oh, they shouldn't have created this game because now I'm putting all my money into it. No, idiot. Just don't put your money into it. Put For- the game down. Forrest, he's really upset right now. I don't know what to do. I didn't do anything. Because I have to listen to you guys cry. I'm not crying. Again, not crying. I think you're like, once again... Over something that does not matter. Oh, you're like not even I, playing the game. That was smart how you cut the camera like that. I like that. I just saw that you did that. That's That was really smart. Great job. What if they started charging for that? They do probably charge for it. <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, Forrest says it's totally gonna get worse. Uh, Devro's really upset right now, so I'm just gonna let him have his thing. Um, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna upset him further. <laughs> you know, it's a great game. Buy it if you want. Play it if you want. Or, if you don't like it, don't. That's the great thing about, you know, this free country we're in, you know, or free, we're part of the free world, you know? Just do what you want. Right? Absolutely. Okay. You, you, you we're still, still talking about it. What's you just, the next, what's well, because you just seem really upset. You just seem really upset. No, I don't know what to do. You, at the end of the story, you, you finally said the thing that just mattered in the beginning. If you don't want to pay for it, don't pay for it. Well, yeah, it's a slippery slope. So you should definitely, if you're concerned slope. about it, you should right. definitely keep that in mind. You should wear, you should get non-slick shoes. And stop I have them. And I have, I have non-slip shoes. Oh, so you, should, you shouldn't be worried about slippery slopes then. Well, it's still, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I would love to like if it like if this was like a, a movie like fast forward five years from now it's like all games have it and Deborah's like oh this just sucks man I'm just like yeah if only someone uh, cared about it at the first stage like this is how this is how the Nazis came into power it's like oh it's like oh it's no big deal you know they're just you know they're they're making the world better it, like you know you have a choice you don't have to be part of the Nazi party fast forward five years they put something in a market and you call them Nazis <laughs> no I'm just yeah using that's this, all <laughs> You put something in a market, you're like, fucking Nazi? <laughs> uh, anyways. Um, I guess we can move on if you want. 
Uh, number six, Assassin's Creed Jade is being delayed to possibly to 2025. Uh, in an updated report from Reuters, Assassin's Creed Jade is possibly delayed to 2025 following a shakeup at Tencent. I didn't realize Tencent was making that game. Or if I did, I forgot. I prefer this industry to be policed. You know what? I, I agree, Forrest, but this guy, he's going to get upset, so we got to move on. we got to move on. Let's police everything. Te- text just... me later, Forrest, about how much yeah, we agree. Yeah, you guys text each other. He, he's, 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 he's upset. He's worked up. He's, he's upset. Um, anyways, uh, Reuters Anonymous source claims that Tencent has redeployed hundreds of people from the team developing Assassin's Creed Jade. Instead, the devs are now working on a mobile party dream game, Dreamstar. Ubisoft did not confirm an actual release date for Jade, but many speculated on a 2024 window. Ubisoft did not officially confirm a delay of the game, nor respond to Reuters' report yet. Assassin's Creed Jade is a mobile adventure game taking place in ancient China. A variety of gameplay leaked online in 2023, including over two hours of footage last August. Surprisingly, fans also gained access to Assassin's Creed Jade Beta in 2022, Players got the chance to check out the entire beta version of the game on their mobile devices. However, it was only a beta, and Jade is sure to change and improve leading up to full release. Um, For the time being, fans of the franchise are looking forward to Assassin's Creed Red. It takes place in feudal Japan. Um, So, so this is really kind of disappointing, because Jade is, uh, you know, honestly, probably one of the first mobile games that I'm sitting here, like, really anticipating, and, like, I really want to play it. Um, so to see it kind of get delayed following a shakeup at Tencent is, uh, extremely disappointing. Um, hopefully the game comes out. I mean, it's, it sounds like Tencent is like, oh, let's it work on like something else. Console game. Like, well, that's why I'm so excited for it. It just looks really good and really yeah. promising. This isn't gameplay for Jade, by the way. This is... Yeah, I was gonna say, this is Valhalla, right? Or no, Odyssey. Odyssey, yeah. Odyssey, But yeah. no, like, we saw gameplay of it and it just looks like a full game they have on the phone. Yeah. So. And, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by it. I would like for it to come out, but, you know. We'll have to see. Number seven on the headlines. Uh, The U.S. is suing Apple over a smartphone monopoly, citing cloud gaming as a key example. In its lawsuit, the U.S. Department of Justice gives... By the way, Forrest, are you ready? (laughs) Is Forrest ready for the the courtroom drama to return? You should get like a little like intro song for courtroom drama. (laughs) But anyways, we're back. We're back, Forrest. We're so back. In the lawsuit, the U.S. Department of Justice gave five key examples of areas in which Apple allegedly suppresses competition, one of which is cloud streaming, game, cloud streaming game apps. The others are super apps, messaging, smartwatches, and digital wallets. The cloud gaming section argues that Apple has prevented developers from offering cloud gaming apps on the App Store, claiming that one of the main reasons for this is to force them to buy more expensive hardware. The argument made is that if players could stream games over the cloud with App Store apps, they could play visually impressive games using older Apple devices, rather than having to update to more powerful and expensive hardware to do so. For years, Apple has blocked cloud gaming apps that would have given users access to desirable apps and content without needing to pay for expensive Apple hardware because this would threaten its monopoly power, the lawsuit claims. He later explains cloud streaming allows developers to bring cutting-edge technologies to services to smartphone customers, including gaming and interactive artificial intelligence services, even if their smartphone includes hardware that is less powerful than an iPhone. It adds, Apple has promoted the iPhone 15 by promising that its hardware is powerful enough to enable next-level performance in mobile gaming. But powerful hardware is unnecessary if games are played via cloud streaming apps. Cloud gaming apps deliver rich gameplay experiences on smartphones without the need for users to purchase powerful, expensive hardware, continues. As a result, users with access to cloud-streamed games may be more willing to switch from an iPhone to a smartphone with less expensive hardware because both smartphones can run desirable games equally well. The lawsuit accuses Apple of blocking cloud streaming apps for this reason, saying Apple wielded wielded its power over app distribution to effectively prevent third-party developers from offering cloud gaming subscription services as a native app on the iPhone. Even today, none are currently available uh, on the iPhone. Apple announced in January that it was allowing game streaming apps, theoretically making native apps like Xbox's Game Pass Ultimate Cloud Streaming possible. However, in an interview with The Verge the following month, Phil Spencer said the proposal doesn't go far enough to open up competition, adding, there's no room for us to monetize cloud gaming on iOS. 
The lawsuit will provide more headaches for Apple, which has denied the Department of Justice claims and says it will vigorously defend itself. Uh, the company has already had to concede some of its control in the EU following the introduction of a new regulation, the Digital Markets Act, which went into effect this month and aims to ensure the so-called gatekeepers like Apple don't use their dominant position in the market to stifle competition. Dev, so in your opinion, Forrest is back. <laughs> Forrest, we're still talking about the courtroom stuff. Um, Dev, in your opinion, do you think that the Department of Justice is accurate in thinking that Apple has a monopoly? At least in terms of the gaming stuff, you could say. guess so i don't know it's weird because you don't think of apple devices as gaming devices like you, that's usually the opposite um i don't know i don't know what's going to come of this um well i mean i, I don't know i'm kind of i think that apple definitely does in my opinion have a monopoly um both in gaming i mean I wouldn't say specific, I honestly wouldn't say gaming. I would say at a lot of other. Well, games. I think in gaming they they really they they there are competitors that want to compete on the platform such as Xbox and Epic Game Store, and these platforms are being stifled and not allowed to compete with Apple on the Apple products. Well, like in my mind, and and like really what sets for me the kind of like the bottom line on this is kind of something that Ty and I were talking about on the Discord the other day, where he pointed out like well Windows had to become an open source platform you know so it's like that was something that was forced to happen where microsoft had to do that so i i think that by that logic i mean it's kind of the same thing like they should definitely have to do that but i mean there's also other things that go on in apple like obviously to stifle competition in the smartphone market i mean like as an android user like i can't tell you how many times i've sent a like a photo to an iphone user and iphone apple like legitimately lessens the quality of like pictures and videos and like, I don't know if you've read about this, but it, like Android phones, if you send something to an iPhone, the app, like it lowers the quality of it for the iPhone user to make it seem like, oh, well, we, you know, Android phones are just lesser quality yeah. and like things like that. Like Apple's done that type of stuff for like ever or like how they kind of like send updates to their older phones to to break them. So that way they force you to buy a new one. Like, I think those are all really unfriendly consumer practices, mm -hmm. things that have always kept me away from Apple in general. Like, I've never owned a, uh, an iPhone. Like, I mean, I've used them. Like, my wife's had them. Austin used to have them. And they did the same thing. So, I get uh, that. But, I mean, if they're, you know, you got to fight back. Kind of you got to fight back. But, you know, you can't just let someone punch you in the face, you know. It's a slippery slope. So you go to someone else to punch you in the face? No, you punch him back. <laughs> no, you don't. You go, it's like, you ah, this guy just punched me in the face. I'm going to punch you back. That's not what you did. Well, no, it is. You want to, you want well, to not what I did. It's what Samsung did. I don't know. Well, you know? Slippery Wait, slope. What do you mean? They're not They're not attacking Apple. They're coming at us. Slippery, slippery slope. No, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm messing. Gaslighting Apple be like this is for us. I agree. But we'll keep you updated. They have a monopoly in general, yes. Yeah, I don't know if it's gaming specific, but yeah. They I, well, definitely... they use gaming as an example as one of the five reasons. Remember, there was five reasons they said, and it was like mess. I already closed the the, the article, but it was like messaging, while virtual wallets, watches. I forget what the other gaming. I forget what the other one was, but that was just one argument in their in their portfolio or in in the lawsuit. But let's move on. Uh, number eight in the headlines. Uh, really interesting story following last week's. It's a follow-up uh, to the story that Toys for Bob is now an independent studio. Uh, Xbox has reached an agreement with Toys for Bob for their next game. <coughs> Excuse me. Toys for Bob, known for handling Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, is now working with Microsoft on their first game since going independent. Microsoft finished its blockbuster acquisition of Activision Blizzard a few months ago, giving firm control over mega franchises like Call of Duty, Candy Crush Saga, and World of Warcraft. As part of the acquisition, Microsoft has also snapped up a ton of other studios and franchises, including classic Activision game series like Guitar Hero, Skylanders, many more. In yesteryear, the legendary team at Toys for Bob were instrumental in building out Activision's big Skylanders franchise, which included Toys to Life gameplay elements, similar to Nintendo's Amiibo line. Players could buy small figurines with NFC chips baked in and then place those characters within Skylanders video game via a USB peripheral portal. 
Toys for Bob also were involved in various Crash Bandicoot titles, as well as producing a fourth installment, Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time. However, in recent years, and during COVID-19 pandemic especially, Toys for Bob were increasingly leaned on by Activision to support in the Call of Duty effort, working as a support studio on various entries in the series. Uh, sources have indicated to Windows Central that Toys for Bob's culture didn't gel with Activision's often restrict corporate mandates. They were excited for the opportunity to spin out as an independent uh, studio in agreement with Microsoft. Um, it seems, though, during a recent town hall meeting described to Windows Central by sources familiar with the event, a staffer asked the panelists about Toys for Bob given that they're now going independent separate from Microsoft and Activision. Toys for Bob's leadership was adamant about keeping the team together and also about returning to the style of game the studio is known for. Microsoft referenced how they spun out Twisted Pixel in the past, an alternative to a shutter option to shuttering studios. Uh, Matt Booty, now leading Xbox's game content division, reportedly said that an agreement had now been reached between Xbox and Toys for Bob for their first game as an independent studio. Um, however, he stopped short of describing exactly what it'll be. He did say something along the lines of, uh, it will be similar to games Toys for Bob has made in the past. So, you know, Xbox is completely funding this game. And I think this is an interesting dynamic that they're going to have with Toys for Bob here where... Yeah, it's why let them go if they're just going to fund their next game. You know what I mean? Well, I think that... Don't you want the next project to be, if not exclusive, at least under your IP, under your banner? You so here's, I mean? here's some thoughts for me. Number one, this doesn't necessarily mean that the next game won't be an, uh, an Xbox exclusive. Whatever that means in the future. We don't know. But you know what I mean? Like, whether it be timed or whatever. That doesn't necessarily mean that the game won't be exclusive. Like, you could look at other, you know, console manufacturers where it's like they have second-party studios that they work with. Like, Nintendo never owned Rare. You know what I mean? Like, Nintendo doesn't own... Like, Retro Studios is a studio that... Like, I think there's some ownership there, but, like, they go out and they make these games on their own. Like, they put out the, the Donkey Kong Country games and some of the Metroid Prime games. They're the ones working on Metroid Prime 4 right now. Like, so, I, I think that there is some logic here where you let the studio run independently on its own and run its own business. And then you just work with Xbox. Like I, I do understand it in some capacity. Um, I get that, but I just didn't see them getting funding from, it was Xbox. a quick turnaround, wasn't it? Yeah. Where they were like, all right, you, you guys are independent. Here's some money. Go make a game. And, yeah. <laughs> I, but I think that's really cool from Xbox. Actually. I think that like, it's but a, why, I, it's just, it's just why make them independent at that point. If you're, if you, if you're going to give them money, you should still, well, it seems like the vibe to me is that Toys for Bob wanted to control their own destiny, and they wanted the freedom to make those choices. You can still do that. You can still you can let developers be developers. Hey, I don't know. I mean, I'm just I, I think that like there, it's not like it's a new thing. It, you know, it's it doesn't set a precedent necessarily. I know you you get really big on things that have been happening for a long time, and you know, not being precedents and everything. But um, I just I'm big on not making a big deal on really small things. One thing you're making a big deal making about this, this is a pretty small thing. This is a pretty this is a pretty small thing. Yeah. But you were like, what is happening? No, I just don't understand why you okay. let a studio go and then fund them. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's fine, though. I th I hope this is a Banjo game. I really want this to be a Banjo-Kazooie game. That would be really cool if, if they're letting Toys for Bob make a Banjo-Kazooie game. It sounds like they want to do something new. Something new that... I think they just want to make games that they want to make, and they were forced... And I think, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if kind of this is why. Like... Toys for Bob was forced into making call, like so being a support yeah. studio for Call of Duty. I could imagine the heads of that studio just being like, "Hey, like we still want to work with you, but like can we just have freedom to like run our business? Like we don't want to be a Call of Duty support studio. We don't want the op we don't want you guys to force us to be that. So like what if we just work together?" I wonder if it was in the con like in some contracts before the talk. I mean, well, keep in mind also Xbox funding the game is cheaper than owning the studio because like you're like you know what I mean like there's probably some extra costs involved somewhere like not just making the game that like owning a studio would probably you know what I mean if that makes if that's making sense I don't know yeah I guess I don't know um so Microsoft's yeah. a really struggling company so you gotta get funds where you can times are tough you know they understand it's a slippery slope the name of this episode should be it's a slippery slope if we named episodes. <laughs> Slippery slope. Um, let's move on to the headline number nine, Resident Evil 9. I didn't do that on purpose. 
um, is going to possibly be an open world game. According to a new tweet from reputable leaker Dusk Gollum, Resident Evil 9 could potentially build on the RE engine and go open world. RE9 has reportedly been in the works for years, and many speculate it will launch in 2025. The most recent core game is Resident Evil Village, which launched in 2021. Dusk Gollum posting at user at Aesthetic Gamer 1 also claims that Monster Hunter Wild is building on the same tech. However, they do reassure fans that both RE9 and Monster Hunter Wild should still retain the series DNA um, or of either franchise. Resident Evil Open World, how, how do you feel about that? I don't, I don't play the games, but they look like they can work fine in open world. I mean, I think people. I think it's going to be the same with the Zelda, where people are going to miss the more dungeony aspects. Yeah. Of Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's about it. I don't know. I think it could work well. I mean, so like, I, I'm always willing to give it a chance, but I do continue to have concerns about that type of thing, where it's like, I just think not every game needs to be an open world, and I'm not saying that means it's going to be a bad game. Mm-hmm. Um, there are open world games that I love. I think but, they just want to try something new. I get it, and like I'm, I'll be there for it. Um, but I do think that something, one of the things that makes Resident Evil special, is its claustrophobic environment, mm-hmm. where it's like even when you were playing like the older games on Raccoon City, like they were still kind of set areas, like they weren't like open, open. To be areas. fair, it's just as scary as when you're like when you're outside a building and you're wide open and like it's like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like both really work well, and I think you can do both in, in a, yeah, perhaps in an open world. Yeah. So we'll see, uh, but it will be an interesting direction. Being chased by something in the streets. And so it's open. all I'll say, if you're going to go open world, and this is just a request for me as a fan of the franchise, if you're gonna go open world, you gotta go back and do a city setting again. Like that's what me as a fan. I think that would be cool. Like if it was a completely open, like a complete city. Yeah, that would be cool. Actually, that would be way cooler than just like, hey, you're in this random country in Estonia where, <laughs> where there's a bunch of villages. Yeah. Like. I think Something, it would be way cooler to kind of dive back into the roots of the franchise while be, doing the open yeah, world thing. It's scarier when it's more familiar. So yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Right, yeah. yeah I would love that. Yeah. Kind of like, like I would almost like say like kind of like a division map kind of deal. Like how, how that world was kind of laid out. Okay. But, but maybe go a little bit more in depth with the buildings and stuff. You know, be an actual good game on like <laughs> the division. Division's great. I know you like it a lot. That's why I said that. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about Bungie, Devro. You ready to follow up on, on Bungie, how Bungie's going? How are they doing? <laughs> let me tell you. They're doing great, right? No, well, let me tell you. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about Marathon today, though. We're actually not going to talk about Destiny. We're going to talk about Marathon. Uh, we have two headlines, uh, and one of them is Bungie has replaced the game director with a former Valorant director. Um, Bungie has made a shakeup at the top of the Marathon development team, replacing the game's director, according to IGN. Christopher Barrett, who had been working on as Marathon Game Director, has been removed from his position. Taking over as Marathon Game Director is Joe Ziegler. Ziegler was the former Game Director on Valorant before he left Riot Games for Bungie back in 2022. Ziegler confirmed the move himself on Twitter on Tuesday. Um, Fun update. For the last nine months, I've been working on Marathon as the Game Director, he said. We're still baking, but I'm excited to share with you more info on the game as we get closer and closer to bringing it all to you. According to IGN's Rebecca Valentine, a number of changes were made uh, to the team amid ongoing anxiety within Bungie following layoffs last year. On top of that, sources told Valentine that Bungie is pouring resources into getting Marathon out of the door. Um, That report was actually pretty crazy. I I think I actually forgot to put it, ironically enough, in my notes. Uh, Because I don't think this other one actually includes that. No. Okay, so um, I actually forgot to include one of them. So it should have been three headlines. But uh, so basically what's going on with that is is that Bungie is trying to get Marathon finished and launched as soon as possible. Because there is a conflict with the heads of Bungie. Apparently there's like a big bonus that's going to be paid out to them. I believe in 2025 or 2026. And it, it has to do with the acquisition when Sony bought them. It's like, hey, we're going to go this amount of time, and then we're going to pay you out this money. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently, like, a lot of the heads of Bungie are going to leave Bungie when they get these massive paydays in, like, a year or two. So their, their, their mindset right now is just get this thing the fuck out the door. We don't care if it's good. We don't care, if it, like, we don't care the quality. We just got to get Marathon done and get it out. Which... I, again, I'm not sure what happened to it. I did like I had it in my notes, but now I don't have it. That so sucks. I messed up making the script. Sorry, guys. Um, that 
That sucks. It does suck. Uh, and then also, according to uh, a new report, according to IGN, Marathon will now also change its style of game to be that of a hero shooter and have a cast of heroes rather than custom player characters. Uh, in late 2022, Insider Gaming exclusively broke the story that Bungie was reviving the Marathon series as an extraction sh- shooter. Uh, in mid-2023, they broke the news of the gameplay loop. Uh, the new report from IGN implies that the game's direction has shifted since these reports, including a change that will move away from custom player characters in favor of a, in favor of a selectable cast of heroes. Uh, that means Marathon will fall in similar vein to Apex Legends or Warzone, where players pick from a select pool of customization options per character presumably the decision has been made to increase its live service monetization potential because you know you love to hear that when they're talking about making a game Um, like it it feels like a step backwards in a way it does i agree as expected the community are not happy following the news with many expressing their frustration online content creator westy said yeah well my enthusiasm has moved away from marathon now in favor of games that don't have hero characters um, with content creator Shoda following up with guys, it's all right. Here's a li- here's a list of recent hero sh- shooters that did well. Deborah, could you read the, the list? The list starts right here and ends right there. Go ahead. There's nothing there. It's empty. Oh wow! Yeah, it's just dash 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 dash. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So this is this is a game that like has instantly fallen off off my radar. I'm not a fan of hero shooters. Like, I've tried some of them. Mm-hmm. I just don't get into them. It's like, but like, I don't know. I don't I have no idea what Marathon is going to be like. But just based off the trail they showed, it was like, I want to play whatever that is. You and now I mean? they're not making that, though. Yeah, it's not that. It's it's not, just not that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It sounds like they're really late on a hero shooter's... Yeah. The hero shooter party. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, it's all about profits at Bungie right now. They don't care if the game's good. And like... I understand that how how you feel about live service games. We're not going to do that, you know. We're, well, here's the thing: it was going to be a live service game no matter what. Yeah, but now they're like leaning into it. Like yeah. the things that don't work in these live service games, they do. They want to do those things. So I mean, we'll have to see. But like Marathon has really jumped off my uh, jumped off my radar. It was on my radar, and and now it's not. Um, all these issues going on at Bungie. Now there was again. I I really messed up with the Bungie news this week because. I couldn't get it really super verified, so I didn't want to report on it. But there was a an email that was going around. Um, I know Paul Tassie from, from Forbes kind of talked about it. And even he was skeptical of it because he couldn't super confirm it. But it was basically like people at Sony, like the, the Japanese part of Sony wants to like close Bungie. They're not happy with Bungie. They want to like go nuclear with Bungie. And then like there's apparently someone in, in the western side of Sony where they're like, no, let, let like let's take... Uh, Bungie and kind of like kind of like take it over and like really like run it ourselves and it's like a whole big thing where like things are just not going well at Bungie. It's it's really unfortunate to, to see. That sucks. It does. Um, but let's move on to another studio, a studio that's doing much better than Bungie, uh, Larian Studios. Uh, Larian, the creators of Baldur's Gate 3, are saying that they are moving away from the Baldur's Gate franchise. Um, speaking at GDC, the Baldur's Gate 3 director said the company has no plans to make DLC expansions or even a sequel to one of last year's best-selling and most critically acclaimed games. Instead, the Belgian indie developer and publisher, also known for its Divinity RPG series, wants to work on something new. We are a company of big ideas. We are not a company that that's made to create DLCs or expansions, he said. We tried that actually a few times. It failed every single time. It's not our thing. Life is too short. Our ambitions are very large. Baldur's Gate will always have a warm spot in our heart. We'll forever be proud of it, but we're not going to continue in it. We're not going to make expansions with which everybody is expecting. We're not going to make Baldur's Gate 4, which everybody is expecting us to do. We're going to move on, and we're going to move away from D&D, and we're going to start making a new thing. Uh, a lot of... So there was some speculation that they just didn't want to work with um, Wizards of the Coast anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you had seen that. Yeah. Um, I think one of the developers came out and said that wasn't true, but I mean, you know how word is. Whether it's true or not, I really like this. Like, Mm -hmm. listen, we put out three of these games. We know what we're good at. We know what we're not good at. We're going to move on to the next IP. We dropped a banger for you. Enjoy it. Yeah. It was a full game. They didn't, they didn't have to do any like DLC or anything like that. They dropped a full complete game. 
10 out of 10 everywhere. We're done. We're going to move on to something next. I, I like it. I don't like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I mean, another, you know, another news with, uh, Larian, uh, one of the directors said that publisher greed has been, uh, messing up the industry and causing layoffs. You know, he basically kind of went on a little bit of a tangent about that. Okay. Um, but we're going to move on. They're very vocal over there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're a self-funded funded yeah. publisher. They, you know, they don't really answer to anybody, yeah. so they, they just kind of say whatever they want to say. Which is, you you need people like that in absolutely. the industry. Absolutely, No paywall to fast travel in Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah. It's great. You know. And if there was, you just didn't have to pay for it. Well, it's a slippery slope. It's not slippery. It's very slippery. I've never slipped once. That's because you don't even stand on the slope. I do. No, I don't think you do. I stand on the slope. I don't think you stand on any slopes. I'm just not clumsy. I've, I've never seen you stand on a slope ever. I've seen you slip, to be fair. Because it is slippery. Yeah. Well, not for me. Well, you, you're never you on You were too it. busy getting up. You didn't see me slip because you were on the ground. Oh, so you did slip. No, you didn't see me slip because I didn't slip. Oh, now it's... You didn't see me because I didn't. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, you were on the ground. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Now we have to go rename this episode to episode 59. It's a slippery slope. Um... Let's move on. Uh, another update story from last week with the uh, the Apex Legends hack. Earlier this week, or last week at this point, North American finals were postponed for Apex Legends after players reported that they were suddenly being given cheats like aimbots and wall hacks through no fault of their own. Oh, this story again. Uh, we can barely hear Dev, apparently, says Forrest. Uh, I'll speak louder. Uh, according to the postponement at the time, Respawn only said it was due to the competitive integrity of the series being compromised, and that it would share more information soon. Well, they've made a statement. The studio has confirmed that players were hacked while playing the game, and it's releasing a series of updates that it believes will add extra protection to the game. O- quote, On Sunday, a few professional Apex Legends players' accounts were hacked during an ALGS event. Respawn's statement reads, Game and player security are our highest priorities, which is why we paused the competition to address the issue immediately. Our teams have deployed the first of a layered series of updates to protect the Apex Legends player community and create a secure experience for everyone. Thank you for your patience. So, I thought this was a really funny uh, thing for them to say, but, like, there was no mention, like... Is the game safe to play? Like, our game was hacked. We don't know what happened. That's all we could say at this time. Yeah. It's like, if you're an Apex player, are you, are you, you're like, uh, can I can I play the game? Like, if I go on there, am I going to get hacked? Like, what's going on? Like, not a word on, on that from Respawn, which is pretty crazy. Which, I, which I'm assuming, if the game was dangerous to play, I, I'm sure they would say something. I guess, but, like, you should probably clarify at least, right? Yeah. Um, It was a very targeted hack, you know what I mean? Yes, well, what if I told you that the hacker had did it for the lulls? Yeah. Uh, last week, Apex Legends Global Series Tournament was rocked by a situation that we were just talking about. In a recent interview with TechCrunch, the hacker himself, or themselves, that actually did this, you know, they did this interview, uh, known as Destroyer2009, explained why he hacked the competitors. Uh, following the scandal, thousands of Apex Legends players avoided the game as, th- as though it were plagued out of fear that they too would suffer at the hands of some unseen cheater. In an interview with TechCrunch, Destroyer2009 explained that he hacked the players just for fun, but he never directly interacted with their devices. Instead, he lent, he leant on a vulnerability in the game to mess with the tournament, and stressed that the hacks never went outside that game. Bizarrely, Destroyer2009 tried to justify his behavior by suggesting it could have been worse. Um, he said, just imagine if it wasn't a joke and we didn't put any memes in the cheat. I'm pretty sure you can ruin someone's career if they had a cheat pop up on a tournament. I mean, I guess. He's like, ah, yeah, I, I hacked it. Could have been worse, though. Um, he even insisted he picked his victims specifically because they were nice guys who deserved the free attention and the views they got from the incident. At this point, it's nothing if not a testament to how some hackers and malicious operators have developers on strings manipulating their games with ease, says Insider Gaming. Um, This hacker, man, he's like, hey, I chose the nice guys who I wanted to get views to. That's why I hacked them. Did it for the fun. Could have been worse. Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, that's that's what's going on over there with Apex. Um, Fun times. Uh, next up on the headlines, a... Said it was a slippery slope. Yes. 
Um, speaking of slippery slopes, uh, PlayStation has lost a longtime veteran of the of the publisher, uh, and they're going to Electronic Arts. In October of last year, PlayStation's longest-serving employee, Connie Booth, left the company. The former head of production at PlayStation suddenly exited the firm amid rumors that she was pushed out the door, but the reasons for her departure were never made clear. She'd been at PlayStation for 34 years, and original... An original claim stated that her team walked out after her. Four says, have him hack Dragon Dogma 2 fast travel. <laughs> now that would be fun. <clears throat> um, but now, in an exclusive report by IGN, it was explained excuse me, that Connie Booth has stepped into a general manager action RPG role at EA. She'll be working to shape the future of the series of studios, including Motif, Cliffhanger, and Bioware reporting directly to recently appointed head of EA Entertainment, Laura Meal. Uh, that means that she will have direct input on games like Iron Man, Black Panther, Mass Effect 4, and Dragon Age Dead- Dreadwolf. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, good. that's a good get for EA. Obviously someone who's around PlayStation for 34 years, that's, yeah. uh, that's going to be good for them. So we will see how that goes. Hope it turns out well. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of an update here from Insider Gaming on X Defiant. Uh, not sure if you remember X Defiant, but it's a Ubisoft had this free to play gem on their hands uh, back in September 2023 called X Defiant. The gameplay was good, the community was bustling, transparency from the developers was highly praised, and most of all, the game had a really passionate and dedicated community. Six months on, and things are somewhat different for X Defiant, with fans increasingly expressing their frustration with the lack of updates. According to Ubisoft's Q- quarter three earnings report, X Defined is, is scheduled to be released by the end of March 31st, 2024. But with literally like a week left on this date, until that date, there's been zero indication of its full release. The once loathed transparency is now seemingly dead, uh, and X Defined hasn't had an update for some time. Speaking with developers at Ubisoft who wish to remain anonymous because they're not authorized to speak about company plans, it's understood that X Defiant was aiming to release during the last week of February, when this internal release date was made public via Ubisoft's earnings call, a deadline that has obviously been missed. Insider Gaming understands that X Defiant has missed dozens of internal targets in the past couple of years, including release dates, putting the game firmly in the realm of other Ubisoft titles that is constantly in limbo. Developers working on the project are becoming incre- increasingly frustrated with the lack of progress and, in short, The game's shortcomings stem from executives' pursuit of trying to copy Call of Duty rather than building their own game. Creatively, it's frustrating for the team, but from a technical perspective, it also presents new challenges and has become the main reason for the delays. The never-ending hunt to chase Call of Duty and add pointless stuff always breaks the current build, said one source, which often requires days of fixing the game. As is generally always the case with games in Limbo, the root of the problem comes from the higher-ups with the with the developers left with the burden. In truth, if you're a fan of X Defiant, uh, Insider Gaming says that they would be a little more wary in the future of the whole transpar- transparency thing, as it's usually a bigger implication that doesn't reflect what's truly going on. Um, so, that's kind of where where they're at with it. Uh, the good news is that the game isn't in danger of being cancelled, and is still in development. Um, still ongoing at its usual rate. In fact, just today, X Defiant had a substantial playtest, to test the netcode, online store, social media tabs, uh, and the current plan is to have another large open public test as soon as possible. Um, this kind of just seems like a case of hopefully the game comes out and it's good. I mean, it seems like yeah, the I do want it, to be good. it seems like the community was happy with it, and Ubisoft was like, "Well, what if we make it more like Call of Duty?" <laughs> yeah. And the developers were like, "But we don't want it to be like more like Call of Duty." It's like, "Well, yeah, yeah. we're the executives. We're the shareholders." It also sounds like they didn't. They just wanted an update. They're just like, hey, we haven't heard from you guys in a while. What's going on? Like, can you give us an update on the game that we love? And Ubisoft's like, uh, yep, yeah, we're busy. <laughs> yeah. Which, in a way, I do I do think sometimes it is okay to have a game where you don't give updates on your development. But this seems like a very community-driven game. People want to know. You should tell them. So Forrest in the chat making uh, pretty negative comments about executives and shareholders and all that. And I'm sure Ty, listening back on this tomorrow, will definitely appreciate the negativity towards shareholders and executives very very business driven guy i love the guy very business driven guy though he's probably like how dare these developers complain (laughs) it sounds like something he would say um let's move on um 
All right, yeah. Uh, Epic Games is offering 100% revenue to developers for the first six months. Uh, Epic Games has announced that it will be offering developers 100% of revenue generated for the first six months if the game is signed exclusively to the Epic Games Store. The announcement came during GDC as part of Epic's new Now on Epic program. Epic had previously introduced one of the best revenue splits in the industry at 88 to for the developers, 12% to Epic Games. But the move marks a new stage for the publisher. As outlined on the Epic Games blog, after six months of 100% revenue uh, to the developers, the split will go to the standard 88-12. Uh, for developers, the announcement can mean a huge increase in revenues as the majority of game sales generally happen within the first few game months of a game's release. Um... I think this is a really good program for developers for the chance for them to get a hundred percent of their, you know, of their revenue. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is just be exclusive to the Epic games platform, which I mean, I can understand like it is a very limited thing, you know, install base. And we've been talking about exclusives and like, if it's beneficial for them to just put them everywhere. Um, but I mean, I, we, we've seen this with Epic. They're, they're very competitive and trying to really get the, their game store platform mm -hmm. to launch. I mean, obviously they have that 88, 12 split, which is really great for them. But I mean, you're talking about competing with a behemoth like steam. Like that's just, I mean, this is also a reason why they're going against uh, Apple. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. Apple's selling the same, can sell the same games with their own marketplace. And they, they get to they control the split. Market, yeah. They, yeah, they don't, don't want yeah. a market that can undercut them. So. Right. Yeah. That's why Xbox and Epic games want store. want to do business there. It's like, they just they want to grow their marketplaces and their and their consumer base. But this is great for for developers though. Yeah. So good news for them. Moving on, we got a few more headlines to go. Uh, the Sims movie is in the works at Margot Robbie's production company. According to the Hollywood Reporter, it will be produced by Lucky Chap, the company run by Margot Robbie, uh, Tom Ackerley, Jose Ma McNamara, and Sophia Kerr along with Roy Lee from the Lego movies and Miri Yoon of Vertigo Entertainment. Um, we don't really have a lot of details other than that, just that it's starting production. So if you had asked me like a year ago if I thought this movie was going to be good or not, I would probably say no. Yeah, but after the Barbie movie. I, I was <laughs> literally about to say, yeah. I think the Barbie movie really kind of opened a new kind of land, like opportunity for games see. like this. I, I know I could see the first trailer being like, it's showing like, like a flight attendant or something. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of like, Shows their head and she has the green crystal. Yeah. Um, that has a name. They hate when you call it the green crystal, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what it's My called. My wife plays The Sims. I don't know. Yeah, She's so never told me you. what it's called. I have no idea. But yeah, I can, I can picture this movie in my head already. I can picture it. And, and, and you know what? Barbie, and, I, and I think it's going to be good, too. Yeah, I think it'll be good. Like, yeah, if you asked me, I was like, hey, like, Barbie showed that you can take these IPs. Like, when they said they were making a Barbie movie, I was like, mm, it's probably not going to be any good. And then it comes out and it's like, it's actually really good. Yeah. Um, so, like, you can definitely touch into that, lean into that, like, fourth wall breaking meta side of it. And you know, you it's going to be, like, having control over your life or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be something yeah, like, very meta. Like, the, the, main, the main character of the movie is going to be someone that plays the games. And she's probably, like, like not middle-aged, but, like, our age. Our age, like, has no control over her life. And, like, her sim friends teach her. Like they come to the real world and they teach her how to have control or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm like watch that be the synopsis completely. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I'm sure this will be this will be pretty good. Uh, next up, uh, Star Wars Battlefront: The Classic Collection, a game that I'm still kind of working my way through and playing. Um, got its first update this last past uh, this past week on Steam, with the console updates coming hopefully soon. I uh, made a number of changes to multiplayer control schemes, visual audio, and fixing bugs and crashes. Um, I believe it's like, I forget what the number was, but it was a pretty big amount of fixes. Um, let's see. The mods creator, oh, we already talked about that last week. Um, some notable stuff. They fixed a bunch of Battlefield or Battlefront 2 uh, crashes, a crash related to client messages. Uh, launch prompts being present after time out or select and cancel while joining a server um, fixing a crash in split screen <laughs> like again go check out the patch notes there's a lot of them we don't have the time to read them all um, I have not gotten this patch on it yet on Xbox I'm still working my way through playing the game as of, of a couple days ago the servers still weren't working very well but like it's so funny to me because I was playing the the campaign yesterday mm -hmm. and like there's a level 
of Battlefront 2's campaign where you play as Darth Vader on that on the Tanf Four, mm-hmm. which is that first ship from Episode Four where Leia like has the the Death Star plans and yeah. and like it's such a great level because you play as Darth Vader in a closed space and you're just mowing, just mowing down around. rebels. Yeah, and like I'm like fuck, man, this game is so much fun. Uh, ties back and we're live. Yep, we're live. Hey. You can go back and check out the beginning of the show later. We're we're almost done. I mean, we got like a few more headlines to go, but we're wrapping up here hopefully soon. Um, but so. Yeah, I mean, I'm still kind of hanging in there with Battlefront and playing it back and forth with Final Fantasy. Okay. Um, but let's move on to the next headline. The Zelda movie director says he wants it to be serious and cool, but fun and whimsical. Speaking of the newest issue, issue of Total Film, uh, the director, Wes Ball, said, I've been thinking about it for a long freaking time, of how cool a Zelda movie would be. I want to fulfill people's greatest desires. I know it's important, this Zelda franchise, to people, and I want it to be a serious movie. A real movie that can give people an escape. It was announced in November that the film will be helmed by Wes Ball, the director behind the Maze Runner trilogy and next year's Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. He continued, I want to try to create, it's got to feel like something real. Something serious and cool, but fun and whimsical. He told the publication he sees the Zelda film as this whole awesome fantasy adventure movie that isn't like Lord of the Rings. It's its own thing. Um, he says, I've always said I would love to see a live action Miyazaki. That wonder and whimsy that he brings to things. I would love to see something like that. Um, hearing West Ball talk about this Zelda movie. Hearing him say live action Miyazaki already gets me excited. Like, I, Right? Like, <laughs> like listening to West Ball talk about the Zelda movie. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm reading Forrest's chat. Um, it, it, like, just hearing this guy feel like, he, he it just feels like at a very basic level, it feels like he gets Zelda. He's like, hey, like, this isn't going to be, like, Lord of the Rings with a Zelda skin on it. But, like, at the same time, like, it is something that needs to be cool. But it needs to be, like, a Miyazaki live action. Like, I'm just like, oh, okay. He Like, I just feel like West Ball gets it. So, yeah. I got to see the work. But, like, I'm excited I, by the premise. Yeah, I don't, have any, I don't have any, like, worries about this game at all. Um... Ty says he keeps struggling on the comparison for Zelda. What movie or TV show that's out that we could say Zelda can look like this? Really can't imagine one. I agree, Ty, and I think that that's West Ball's point. He's like, it's not going to be like Lord of the Rings. It's going to be its own thing. And I'm really excited to see what they come up with. Uh, and how art is dead because of corporate greed. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to the Zelda movie. I can't wait to hear more about it. Deborah, I went on Amazon last week. Um... With the intention of pre-ordering one of my most anticipated games. Oh, nice. You pre-ordered it. That's cool. You're ready? You pre-ordered it? You got it ready to... Uh, uh, No, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door has topped Amazon's bestseller chart and pre-orders have sold out. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is arguably the most anticipated release on Nintendo's calendar this year. For me, it is. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's one of my most anticipated releases of life <laughs> ever like i love this game so much and i've been begging for years i understand that it's a remake like right like i understand i could go into the game room right now pull it off my shelf and play it but like i love paper mario like at this kind of paper mario so much do for some reason like it, seeing the community's reaction and i guess your reaction too it just it feels dope it feels oh overdue. what's up to ken wall it's been a while ken what's going on man yeah it's gonna be awesome i can't wait thanks man appreciate that um yeah man like it it i cannot wait for paper mario the thousand year door this is honestly like one of the best nintendo games they've ever made like it really is like it's the game that you told me i should play i should i should have started with yeah like because like well we didn't even you didn't even play the n64 one i, I played like an hour or something with you. Yeah, yeah yeah not enough i really want to dive back into this like i again like this is one of those games usually like when you come over i want you to play it if you're not going to play it because you don't like turn-based, I'll play it and you can watch. Like what, this one? Yeah, like no, that. I'll, I'll try it. Yeah, I definitely think you should. Like, it's a short, you can beat it in a day, right? No, no, no. It's 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 a decently sized RPG. It's got okay. like eight or nine chapters. It's, I mean, if you know what you're doing, you could probably speed through it in like 20 hours, I yeah, think. No, but like, not speed through it. Yeah, no, I, I don't think. I wouldn't say it's a short game. Okay. Um, But I love it. But so anyways, yeah, this game sold out on Amazon. That's crazy. Right. And I'm just like. I wasn't expecting it. Like, even I wasn't expecting it. I went on Amazon and it said unavailable. Yeah. So I'm like, now I got to go to GameStop and pre order. Yeah. I'll probably do that when I'm on vacation. Like, just, I'm going to walk into a GameStop. They're like, so this remake comes out, this port comes out in like a month. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> just just pre order it, damn. Yeah. Just 
Give me what I want. Um, so I'm really looking forward to Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. Um, it's going to be great. Uh, next up, Ben Studios' next game uh, could be a live service title. Uh, ben Studio, the, the developer of Days Gone and the creator of Siphon Filter franchise, is working on a game behind closed doors that the world knows very little about. There have been tidbits of information surfaced in the form of rumors over the years, such as the claim that the in-development title is being built with Gorilla's Dec Decima engine, but there's also nothing concrete. Recently, a job listing surfaced online that made numerous references to a live service game being developed at Ben's studio. There's a vacancy at the studio for a lead project manager, and Ben is asking that is asking that they that they're experienced in the realms of live service titles. Um, this would lead one to some to believe that you know Days Gone Two might not be happening. Um, it's been obviously the, the the thing with Ben Studios has kind of been going around for a few years now, like where I know they've been in and out of the news with like they want to work on things, and I think there was a story a couple years ago that they were being forced to work on. Um, like other projects, like remake projects and stuff. Yeah. Ty's asking if we got the 1080p stream figured out. Is, is it 1080p right now? Uh, I followed. I followed just instructions, so I, it should be. I guess. I think it, it looks pretty. I think it looks pretty good, right? It looks the same to me. If I'm being. I think it looks better than it did. It, maybe they should have a 1080p option in YouTube. But... It's a slippery slope, you know. You know, you're just saying it. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely, I am. Ty, you have no idea how much we said slippery slope for this episode. Many times. Not enough times, to be honest. I think the amount of times we've said it is, in and of itself, a slippery slope. Um, Ty says, the Decima engine is insane. Killzone yeah. looked great in the previous gen. Horizon Forbidden West is one of the best looking games out there. I agree with that. That is a gorgeous game, yeah. Horizon Forbidden West. Alright, uh, we're going to move on here because we're getting close to the end of the show. Uh, Stardew Valley has hit its all-time player count eight years after its release. Uh, it's been out for eight years. It hasn't stopped people from being excited about the game. After the game's 1.6 update that was released, uh, Stardew Valley hit an all-time player count on Steam. <clears throat> Excuse me, jeez. As of writing, the game hit a peak of 146,159 player, thousand players on Steam. Uh, that's up 51,280 from the previous high of 94,879 set back in January of 2021. Um... A lot of stuff was added in this new update, including a new major festival, two new mini festivals, a new end game skill system, the ability to play with up to eight people on PC, a new farm type, new crops, new turtle pets, and a lot more. Deborah, did you know that they added in this update of Stardew Valley that you can now drink mayonnaise? Oh, I did see that, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad, because I was like, that was the thing that was stopping me from getting into the Right, game. that's what I was saying. Yeah, I was like, it was like, it's I like oh, now I can drink mayonnaise. Well, first of all, if you drink mayonnaise, you're you're a psychopath. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Like, this is not, this is the one thing that's not a slippery slope. Like, <laughs> you are, you are psychotic if you... <laughs> uh, Kenwall says, I heard it was supposed to be a game set in the Cold War. Oh, for the live service game for Bend? I, I just hope it's good, because, like... I think... The thing is, starting 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 a live service game when you have no history of it, yeah. and you're just like, I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, you you have to have some type of. I mean, I guess you got Bungie that can maybe back you up, but oh, I'm not calling Bungie for making a live service game at this point. Yeah, um, definitely not, definitely not doing that. Uh, but we'll see what I happens with Ben Studios. Is yeah, good enough, you know. But I mean, Days Gone was a very impressive game. So I mean, I I, I mean I. It undersold, it, but like Days Gone, I feel was... like I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I recall I think it was like kind of mixed in terms of like reception. Yeah. But like, and, and it, it's in my backlog. But <laughs> I think people generally liked it. It just didn't sell that well. And I don't know. Oh, Forrest starting to fight in the chat. <laughs> yeah, no one's paying for fast travel because you don't have to because it's your it's your wallet. But it's a slippery slope, and it could lead a set a precedent to start other games charging for fast travel as well. And I just think that but these things. Really. These things should be in check. We argued for like 20 minutes. I understand the but game. the way you check it is by not paying. The way you check it is saying, hey, this is not okay, and I don't think yeah. games should continue to do this. That's all I'm doing. I said, hey, I don't like this. Don't do this. Yeah, just don't pay for it. No, I'm saying don't do it, period. No, just don't pay for it. No, just don't do it. That's not, that doesn't send a message. It does send a message. Like, hey, if I'm not buying your, your game. If you say don't do it, that doesn't send a message. Well, no, I'm saying like I'm not going to buy your Wallets, game, so your don't do it. money talks. Yeah, that's why I'm not buying the game. Yeah, so but know. I need to explain why I'm not buying the game. I'm not, I'm not just some hater. Like I'm just like they're I not going to hear it. They're just going to. Well, you know, look. This is my little corner of the internet. I'm going to say what I want. I'm going to give my thoughts. I'm saying I don't, you know, game's great. 
And if it doesn't affect it, great. But like maybe the next publisher is going to come around and say, hey, you know, they charge for fast travel. Why don't we charge for fast travel? Except no, you do. You don't pay for it. That's what I'm saying. We're saying the same thing. I don't understand why you were getting so upset late earlier. You were, you was getting so upset. <laughs> for the record, we did say that it's not required. Like, I think for I don't know if Forrest understood us. Like, we did say, oh yeah, he gets it from us. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say that it, it's required. I just said that it is a. It is a microtransaction. Is to pay for fast travel. Like that is a thing. That's factually a thing. But anyways, uh, we're gonna move on. We can let them fight in the uh, in the chat some more. Our last headline for the show, uh, grounded, is the next Xbox first party game that is getting a physical collector's edition revealed by limited run. Um, the game is launching on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and Switch on April 16th. Um, and Limited Run Games has has announced that there will be a physical release for it. Um, on March 25th, which is today, uh, gamers can now pre-order the fully yoked edition of Grounded. Um, however, it's not expected to ship until this August, which is usually how Limited Run Games works, unfortunately. Um, but the fully yoked edition comes in two forms, the standard and collector's. Uh, if you're after something a little more special, you'll want the limited runs special edition of Grounded, which comes with a substantial amount of goodies in in the box, a physical copy of the game, series of art cards, display frame, USB cassette tape soundtrack. That's actually pretty cool. Um, a D20 dice set, stickers, art book, miniatures, brand sweatbands, and more. Um, that's a pretty good, actually, bundle for a limited edition for 125 bucks. Like USB cassette soundtrack. Dice, miniatures, sweatbands, soundtracks, display frame, art cards, the game itself. That's not bad, actually. That's a yeah. really substantial. Um, but if you're looking to just get the game itself... <laughs> hold on, Ty. That is a good question. All right, well, so hold on. Ask me the questions. What's the first question? Would you rather... So you're going to play a game. Mm -hmm. Would you rather be a live service game? Would you rather be... Would you rather your favorite developer make a live service game, a mobile game, or a game with transactions similar to Dragon Dogma 2? They have to monetize the game in some way. I mean, honestly, I'm just going to go back and play great video games that I've already bought. <laughs> I mean, that's a fair... Yeah. That's, that's option D. Is, Options, well, option D is I just don't buy that game. <laughs> like, okay, great. Um... Again, like, Ty, you weren't here earlier. You can go back and check us out, like, what we were saying. Uh, for me, look, I understand it may not, like, affect the game overall. But it does set a precedent. I don't agree with charging for something like fast travel. Like, I just don't agree with it. I don't care if it's already available. I think it's a scummy business practice. And I stand by that. You will not ever convince me that a basic feature in a game like fast travel or saving or pausing, not saying that Dragon's Dogma does those, I'm just saying as an example, and there's a base set of things that I think have always been quality of life features for a video game. And fast travel is one of those things. That should not be something that they should be charging for. And then I would also, more specifically for Dragon's Dogma, I would kind of look back at what the developer themselves said about fast travel and how they felt about fast travel, and then kind of question... That seems like a plus to me. Uh, my question is, is like if it's so bad, if fast travel is something you hate so much, why are you putting it in your game and charging for it? Like... Like, it sounds like you're charging for something you don't even believe in. Like, I, I just, it just seems weird. And I think that's where a lot of the people that are upset are coming from, where it's just like, like, you, your, your comments don't really, like, lead to, like, people, like, why are you charging for this thing you don't even want in your game? And then, number two, it's just like, it's a basic quality of life feature. If you went to a restaurant, and you paid for your food, and they gave you your plate, it's like, hey, you gotta pay for this plate if you wanna use this plate. You're, you're not, you're not staying at that restaurant. Like, that's, that's bullshit. Like, you're not paying for your food and then paying for the right to use a plate. Like, that doesn't work that way. It's the same concept. It's like, oh, hey, here's your here's your pasta, sir. Oh, would you like a fork with that? It's going to be an additional $5. Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you buying that fork, Devro? I don't think it's the same comparison. But oh, okay. That's well, fine. That's fine. I mean, you, well, I don't see how it isn't. You could theoretically eat the spaghetti without the fork. You don't need the fork. So what's the problem? No, but you can get you can still get the, the plate. If you want to, if you want an extra plate to take home, yeah, you got to pay for that. That's what they're asking. That's what they're charging. For. Not a plate of food. I'm saying the plate itself. Yeah, you can get the plate for free. You can get the plate just by. Well, no, there's there. no plate for free. Yeah, there is. No. 
Is can't you play? Can't you fast travel in the game already without needing to pay? Ty, and here's the thing, and like your analogy just doesn't work. No, so like, and the thing is, Ty is so like I just disagree with your take, Ty. I I just think that like. Uh, again, you had you'd have to go back and kind of like I really laid my points out. Like I'm not saying that games don't cost money, and I'm not saying that games don't need to be profitable, and I'm not saying that there doesn't need to be ways. It, like I'm not saying there's not ways like where you can make more money, and, and but like I just don't see charging people for something basic like like fast travel as like a good idea like you'll never convince me that charging for fast travel is a good idea you you will never succeed in that do not waste your breath like like i don't care <laughs> it's it's a basic feature in the game like if if a game tried to sell me something like that i would react to i'm reacting with dragon's dogma i would say well that's bullshit that's dumb and i'm not buying your game and i understand that that doesn't lower the quality of the game the game's great i'm not saying anything bad about the game itself like this is not me saying that it's a bad game i'm not going to go on steam and say it's a bad game but it's a slippery slope that's and that's what it is anyways i can't wait for the series finale of video games to come out i'm so tired of talking about dumb stuff like like microtransactions and, and stuff i just want grand theft auto 6 to come out and then video games are over that's it it's done no more video games. Yeah, that game definitely won't have any microtransactions in it. <laughs> no, it totally will. I'm not saying it won't. You out of your mind? Those shark cards that they have? Yeah, they're going to make a bunch of money from those. Um, but what are the shark cards used for? That's the question. That's the thing that, that matters. Like, you were using Assassin's Creed as an example. It's like, oh, you could pay for a new sword. It's like, well, that, that's, that's not the same thing. Like... I don't like it, but I like that. Like that's a more reasonable thing to charge for. It's like, hey, do you want this cool sword we made? Like, I think that's more acceptable, in my opinion. But that's it for the headlines for the week. Let's dive into the releases for the week before we get out of here. So these are the releases for the week of March twenty fifth. Out today, Acolyte of the Altar comes out on PC. Bulwark. The Falconeer Chronicles comes out on PS5, Xbox Series, and PC tomorrow. Uh, the Grandia HD Collection comes out on PS4 and Xbox One tomorrow, March 26th. Planet Zoo Console Edition comes out on PS5 and Xbox Series consoles on March 26th. South Park Snow Day comes out on PS5, Xbox Series, Switch, and PC on the 26th. Ghost Trick Phantom Detective comes out on Android on the 28th. Open Roads comes out on PS5, Xbox Series, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. On March 28th. Outward comes out on Switch on the 28th. Pepper Grinder comes out on Switch and PC. That's what we're talking about. You go to the restaurant, you got to pay for the Pepper Grinder. That's it right there. Um, Madison comes out on PSVR 2, March 29th. Devro, kind of a slower week. What's your pick for the week? Uh, I don't even have one, dude. All right, we got to pick. These games. It's, this, the, it's the segment, Devro. You got to pick one. Open Roads. All right, there you go. Open Roads, actually actually was going to be my pick of the week because it was a game that was shown off it's coming to game pass mm -hmm. um and, and yeah it looks good haven't seen a lot of it originally i would have picked south park snow day but i was checking out the reviews for that today and it does not sound like it's a very good game um seems kind of uh mixed to negative reviews so yeah my pick was going to be op was going to be open roads as well so, yeah. so looking at the gameplay now it's just on my phone like yeah it's a narrative driven kind of game looks yeah, pretty good it looks cool yeah i'm gonna check it out it's gonna be on game pass um, Ty says, Forrest, you say you like, you say it like no, it's No, we're easy. done with that. We're done. Do you know how many games flop and people lose jobs? Your solution isn't a solution. What was the solution? The reality is make a good game and stop doing this weird scummy shit. What, what do you mean we're done? We're done talking about this. No, we're not done. I'm going to, I'm going to. Forrest hit, says this I'm industry is intro, being infected screen. by greed and bottom lines and I'm money. The outro screen. Games used to be art. I, I mean, I agree with Forrest, you know, and a lot yeah, of those. Games aren't art anymore. All right, tune in next week for episode what, 60? Yes, yeah, it's going to be episode 60. All right. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Everyone calm down, calm down. Don't forget to follow us and comment on us and you're, like us. You're not doing a very good job. And subscribe. You're not doing it. Can I, can I do my thing? Please relax, calm down. This has been episode 59 of the Game Room Podcast. Thank you to everyone hanging out with us here tonight. Thank you to Forrest. Thank you to Ty. Thank you to Kenwall. Kenwall posted a new video today. I haven't gotten to check it out yet. But I'm going to check it out. So make sure you go check out his channel. He puts out some great content. Really appreciate him stopping by. Um, you can join our Discord. I ain't done. You know what, Ty? Why don't you be on the podcast next week? Okay, episode 60. Episode 60. Let's have a roundtable. Let's get Forrest. Let's get Ty. Let's, you know what? 
sounds horrible, actually. I have an idea. I have an idea. I have an idea. I have an idea. Episode 60, Ty and, Ty and, and Forrest, you, we just let them go. And we moderate. <laughs> oh, it could be like a, like a debate. Like, we ask them, like, gaming-related questions, and we just let them go back and forth. Ugh. And I then already, we could give our takes. I already hate this idea. This sound. What do you mean? It sound, come on, it's my birthday next week. Why don't we just do that for my birthday? Doesn't that sound fun? No. No. It sounds like a lot of things, but fun is not one of them. Ty and Forrest, will you guys commit to being on the pod next week so we can do this This crazy, this really cool idea? They're still arguing. Ty, Ty, hold <laughs> off. Ty, Ty, wait. Save your ammo for next week. We're going to do, I want to do this. Devro, we're doing this. All right. We're doing this. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Episode 60. Uh, you versus America. <laughs> world, oh, we could, we could make a big deal like World War Four, even though World War Three hasn't happened yet. You know, it'd be funny. Um, anyways, join the Discord. Have fun with us there. We love having fun. I love having good conversation. Uh, yeah, we're built. We're, I'm booking it right now. Next week, episode sixty, probably Sunday. Ty versus Forrest. Neither be, have neither be. have committed to this podcast yet, but we're we're officially announcing it right now. What were you gonna say? I, it feels like I'm gonna be Ty's manager and you're gonna be Forrest's manager. In this. <laughs> I'm gonna hit Ty you with a chair. <laughs> Uh, Ty says he's game. Oh, here we go. It's set. Oh. It's set in stone. All right. So now, Dev, now you have some homework. You got to get the Discord thing working because we gotta. We're gonna have them both on, and it's gonna be the great debate. You and I will come up with gaming questions. I was say, make sure you have a list of questions. We should. Well, we should come up with it together. Okay. Like we'll 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 run it together. I think that's fair. You think? Come on, shake yeah, yeah. shake shake on it. That's good. Come with your own questions. I'll come with my own questions, and then we'll and we'll we'll cross paths. Yeah. I'll I'll text you throughout the week. All right. There you go. It's booked. Episode sixty. A crazy important episode here. Ty and Forrest are gonna go at it. I I'm, it. I'm so excited. I love it. Um, going back to watch what you guys said earlier. Oh yeah, Ty, definitely uh, hit us up in the Discord. We will talk to you guys then. Follow me on Twitter. I think did you put that in the description yet? No, not yet. You'll do that next week. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, come back on Sunday for episode sixty. Very excited for that, and we will see you guys next time. See ya. Oh shit! Jeez, I just slipped. It's a real slippery slope out here. You already have it. Do you think I caught me saying that or? The slipping part, yes. <laughs>